Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about another BRICS in the world. That's B-R-I-C-S, decoding the BRICS summit in Russia. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. Always my pleasure. Well, give us some background, Rupmati. Um, what is BRICS and uh, what is this meeting, which is happening actually this week, in fact, today? Uh, tell us about BRICS. Tell us about the meeting. Jay, now this is the 16th edition of the BRICS Summit. And uh, like we had discussed in our show uh, this time last year, that uh, the 2023 BRICS Summit was uh, when Putin would not attend uh, because he has arrest warrant on him. But this 2024 edition is the first uh, foreign policy uh, event that uh, Putin is hosting in Kazan, um, Russia, a city in Russia. Um, and after the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, which began in uh, nine, uh, 2022. So, Jay, it's a big event uh, from the perspective of uh, Russia. And let's take a little bit uh, uh, backdrop on this, that the BRICS was actually formed between four countries in the beginning. It was just Brazil, India, China, and Russia. In 20, After the 2008 financial crisis, they came together in 2009. And 2010, uh, South Africa joined. And then they took the acronym of the uh, beginning uh, first letters, and they formed this name as BRICS. So, uh, Jay, Basically, it came in uh, in existence because of its economic aspect. So um, we see that uh, this this uh, year's theme is a sustain, strengthening multilateralism for just growth and uh, um, just growth development and security. So this is the broad theme that comes in. Now, Jay, this is a, a very important summit because we see. Uh, from 2020, uh, 2008 till last year, it was just five members. Now, it's last year it doubled up to 10 members. They included Egypt, Ethiopia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And uh, they're having 30 waiting members applications. So, Jay, uh, we have to look at this because it's got a lot of aspects to it because its agenda is expansion of economic cooperation, um, sustainable development, climate change, and the most, most important is trade settlement in national currencies. So we have to focus on that area a little bit more. The reserve currency right now in the world is the US dollar, and it has mm -hmm. been that way in the modern time. Um, these guys are trying to change that. What, what does that mean? Uh, how do you change that? And what does it mean if you do change it? Jay, so we see that uh, uh, the BRICS controls around 24% of the global economy and 41% of the total population. And we have two big members who are fighting sanctions or uh, fighting the US dollar as it means, Russia and China. So Russia's main proposal in this is that it should be an alternative a mechanism for cross-border payments amongst the BRIC members so that they can bypass the global financial infrastructure and uh, technically to protect everybody from sanctions outside. So it's trying to bypass the SWIFT system. And Jay, uh, how do they want to do that? They want a network of commercial banks within the BRIC countries to enable transactions in their local currencies reducing the dependence on the US dollar. So basically, a self-sufficient financial infrastructure resistant to sanctions in a gist. So Jay, uh, what happens in this is they are emerging market economies. They, have, they want to play big decision-making roles in politics. Before this period, it was basically the post-1945 superiority in the political aspect and in the economic aspect. Now, these people, uh, like, uh, for example, in the G7 meetings, they could not allow India and China to be out of the major financial decisions of the world. So they used to invite them as guests, but they had to sit out. So these countries wanted to come to the forefront in decision-making. 
and that's when bricks came up and these people have taken it uh, like a fish to water so they are attending it you have world leaders coming in to russia uh, um, uh, modi of india xi uh, jinping of uh, china um, uh, brazil is not attending because he had a head, head injury and uh, you know turkey um, turkey is applying for yeah erdogan is applying for membership and uh, basically um, putin said that he would not vet the membership the more the people come the more better and J the thing is that putin is showcasing to the world that he is not isolated so it's a showmanship in this summit unlike, uh, like unlike previous uh, summits so that's where uh, this entire thing comes up jay well, i find it very interesting how many how many players are coming in um what why is this in russia what does it mean to have this in russia j 2023 was held they have a rotating uh, presidency they have no uh, set infrastructure for this uh, uh, organization also uh, they keep on rotating amongst the country so 2023 was held in uh, south africa now it is being held in um, uh, russia kazan is the place uh, city where it's being held and uh, putin is hosting it as an international <laughs> uh wanted terrorist so uh, a wanted a criminal so uh, he said that he doesn't recognize it uh, recognize the convention and he can bypass the traveling by a, a agreement between two uh, states so he's got his uh, agenda set and he plans to travel to brazil for the g20 also in the coming months uh, he has got 17 bilaterals planned for this uh, summit j so he is uh, very proactive in the hosting he had uh, the first one of the first leaders to arrive was the uae president and uh, putin hosted him for a private dinner so he's got his personal touch his personal friends coming in you know you have uh, modi putin chuckling uh, amongst each other that you can understand me without translation we are so good at it so all this but the serious matter j is the monetary infrastructure that they're setting up last year was the first year in around 50 years that saudi arabia has detached itself from the dollar now j uh, people may uh, think what is the uh, significance of the dollar and dollar de-dollarization see first we could do transactions in the global financial market it's known as swift by trading dollars for whichever produce you want it's a globally accepted currency and petro dollars is that whoever trades in the oil and gas industry has to make the payments in us dollars so the currency of the us is getting a, a um, acceptability beyond its borders it's it has a usage which is for all trade so when you have these uh, economies which have undergone sanctions trying to bypass this j it will reduce the usage of dollar in these markets and that's where it will hurt because recession will come in now for uh, uh, the competition jay china is a 2 trillion dollar economy 3 trillion dollar um, the us is 20 20 24 trillion so there's no competition in that but we have to think in the long term will they get together will they try to uh, are they is it a rival uh, block to the western group but uh, the answer to that the brics uh, members give that it is not an anti west block it is just not a western block so they were smart in uh, giving the statement that it's never about being anti west and even the us uh, press statement said that the brics is um, not anti west but uh, they are forming a coalition sounds uh, like baloney it is anti west it's competitive <laughs> it's, it's it's trying to topple the west uh, the west and especially the us um are at the top of the economic uh, model uh, in the world and these guys are trying to change that they're trying to topple the us and they're trying to trying to topple western europe too and this is all from what you say this is all putin putin is doing this to putin. thumb his nose at the west to do propaganda against the west um to do propaganda in favor of his uh 
is aggression against uh, Ukraine. I'm, I'm sure that's a big part of it. And he's inviting all his friends who would similarly like to topple the West. Um, and, uh, you know, this is this is troublesome because it it is, um, shall I say, the clash of civilizations. Uh, okay. It is a clash between, you know, large numbers of people and countries. And uh, oh. you can draw the line right between them and see uh, the competition is becoming global. So <clears throat> what can he hope to achieve? It sounds from what you say, it sounds like he's trying to get additional members into BRICS. He's trying to make it stronger. He's trying to, you know, increase uh, the population that's covered uh, and and uh, the economic ties that are that are built. Um, aside from that, what is he trying to do? Is there any military side effect to this? Is there any um, strategic or security issue around BRICS? CJ, 10 existing members and 30 in waiting gives it an um, approximate figure of 40. So uh, they are uh, having a coalition. Militarily, uh, nothing on the table uh, as of now. But economics is uh, 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 because of desperation. We have two countries. Who, uh, Iran has been existing forever under sanctions. And Russia had to bypass these uh, the swift... Uh, um, financial architecture to be able to conduct trade so they have formed this and how they cannot go on it alone so they have used strategically used BRICS to form this coalition now out of that you have south africa and india who do not want to spoil uh, relations with the west because uh, the us is india's biggest trading partner uh, biggest indian uh, diaspora Brazil is right under the umbrella of the U.S. So these countries will never want to go against the U.S. Iran, China, and um, uh, Russia are direct competitors. They are antagonistic competitors. So uh, there is also a disequilibrium in uh, the uh, priorities of the BRICS members. But they are trying to come together in forming this uh, economic coalition so that they can do local currency trading. And that's where it will hurt, Jay. not now, not in few years, not in five years, in 10 years, because it has taken a, around uh, several decades for the dollar to establish itself as the prime currency, trading currency, uh, move, moving currency. So that just printing, how much does it cost to print a note? But that acceptability in the market is what is uh, earned. The reputation of being the prime trading is earned now. When you have this network of commercial banks within the BRICS block accepting local currencies, it will uh, take the priority out of the U.S. dollar a little bit less. That's it. It's just that. Well, you know, it, it strikes me that um, even even stopping right there, you know, without having a firm result of this meeting, Putin has succeeded. Uh, mm -hmm. In thumbing his nose at the sanctions, I mean, completely thumbing his nose at the sanctions, in thumbing his nose at the efforts of the West to stop his aggression. He's also gathered around him people who are countries uh, who are sympathetic to him in, in really in every way. And part of that has to be the oil and gas. You know, when you talk about trade with Russia, you are talking largely about oil and gas because that's what they have. That's what they traded. It all begins and ends there. Um, but what you know, what what is interesting is a comment you made about some countries, um, India, for example, don't want to alienate the United States, and the United States is one of their big trading partners, and and they have, uh, I agree with you, they have a huge di diaspora um, right. around the world, but especially in the U.S. So it's not in India's interest to offend the United States. But frankly, Rupati, isn't it um, obvious that? He, Putin, wants them to offend the United States. By inviting them, um, it sure looks like they're siding with him rather than the United States. And I mean, if I were if I were the United States, if I were the Secretary of State like you, uh, I, <laughs> I would be I would be offended, no? <laughs> they have put it, they have rolled it in the annual BRICS summit, Jay. It's just an annual thing happening from 2008 till now. 
So they have regularized the system. It's not just an emergency meeting that is called. So uh, we can be a little bit rest assured about that, that it's okay for them to have the annual meeting. How far will they go in implementing this infrastructure is the thing, Jay. Because sanctions used to work when we were in a globalized world. When everything was open and uh, you put sanctions, then that country could not trade in the global system, correct? After that, when you have pandemic and there's restriction and Russia is dealing in, like you explained, oil and gas. It's an essential commodity like for Germany who depends upon heavy engineering. They really need the oil and gas. They cannot cut their oil and gas. How many of sanctions you put on them, uh, ask them to uh, put on Russia? It's a heavy engineering dependent country. So they had to uh, deal with Russia in their terms, Russian terms. So, Jay, uh, Russia lucked out on that, that it got this kind of trade. And now it's used that to its benefit and tried to get, see the uh, inclusion of the countries which have, we have been in the BRICS. It's Iran, it's UAE, it's Saudi Arabia, biggest uh, petro, uh, uh, petroleum producing countries. What was the main strength of the dollar dealing? It was the petrodollars. Now, when you have these countries coming in and Saudi Arabia saying that they will not deal in dollars and go for their local currency, it hits Jay. It hurts a bit, uh, but uh, the, the targeted um, strategy of Putin is to attract the oil producing countries into this. Now, out of the BRICS, 70% of the economy in BRICS is dominated by China. But when you have these oil producing countries come in, it's going to tilt the balance in their favor. Add Russia to it, maybe Venezuela comes in, you know, you have a good, good substantial amount control of the oil. So who will put sanctions on whom? <laughs> if, BRICS <laughs> decide, if BRICS decide not to supply oil and gas, it will be a problem. Well, let, let's talk for a moment about how this might affect uh, directly or indirectly uh, the war in the Middle East. He has invited and they are attending Iran. Um, and and uh, he's he's um, he's gotten uh, Saudi Arabia to come, and there's an article in the paper recently about how Saudi Arabia is like changing the position it had before October seventh, uh, mm -hmm. where they were trying to negotiate. They were actively negotiating um, some kind of deal with with Israel, getting closer to Israel. Now, uh, according to the article, they're not so close, and they're moving the other way. And when you see them going to Russia for this BRICS conference and and falling into Putin's lap, um, that that doesn't sound so good for Israel. So the question is, um, you know, how does this all affect Israel when you have um, these anti-Israeli rogue states attending at Putin's request? <laughs> A leader came up to him face to face and told him that stop the war kind of a thing. So uh, that was very um, a first time uh, event. But now Iran and Israel, Jay, uh, out of that, if you see uh, India supplies um, ammunition to Israel and is a big, big close friend of Israel. So it's not going to, uh, and also it has historical ties with Iran. It's never take, it will not take sides in this. It will never leave Israel because uh, the friendship that has grown between Israel and India is uh, in Modi's period. Before Modi, the Congress which was there had isolated Israel away from. They were, and J. Palestine uh, President also Mahmoud Abbas is also attending this conference. So uh, Putin is trying to put out a statement that BRICS is going to support a two-state uh, solution to the Middle East conflict, which is a humbug. It will never happen. Um, it has to need. It doesn't need the BRICS uh, consent to go ahead with uh, a solution like this. Chief. I I wonder, you know, what it's like when you have a responsible nation like India rubbing mm -hmm. shoulders with rogue nations like mm -hmm. Iran and and 
Turkey is also becoming a rogue nation. We've talked about that. Um, and I don't know who else he invited, but uh, my recollection is he invited a number of rogue nations to be there. And so it must be very uncomfortable for a country which, you know, you would not consider a rogue nation to be bedfellows with countries that are rogue nations and that the world recognizes are rogue nations. Is that, you know, good policy? Jay, he puts, uh, I, I, I've I studied Modi. Modi puts blinkers on. It is economics for the country. Uh, strategic partnership with Russia, but economics for the country. In the bilateral, there have been, uh, um, you know, India's cooperation uh, opportunities in the Arctic zone, which are oil-rich countries. So that was never happening with us before. So the more Putin is trying to woo India, India is lapping it up. Because as a developing country and as a nation of 1.4 billion and competing with China over the head, you need everything that you can get. So he's going the right path by uh, maintaining a straight stance. Okay, if he had Modi had come in in the summit and said that he supports um, the Ukraine-Russian um, conflict, uh, Russia's side, it would have been a problem. But he first statement is that you have to have a peaceful settlement of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. So on his face was a very new new thing for me, Jay. I hope he doesn't get too close to those guys. You know, it'll 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 sort of contaminate him from an international reputation point of view. Let's talk about the United States. Obviously, yeah. the United States is not there, hasn't been there, wouldn't be there, and won't be there. But what can the United States do about this? This is happening underfoot. It's happening in direct contention to uh, the United States' uh, global hegemony. Um, what, what's, the, what's Biden doing? And should he do more? Yeah. Jay, this uh, uh, exclusion of Russia from the G7, G8 to G7, uh, bringing about sanctions on it, um, we have to take into account very... Um, emphatically that it is a big niche. It tries, to, it was a superpower. It is no longer a superpower. We have a hegemon in the US, but uh, the US when it implemented sanctions, I felt it was too quick in implementing sanctions. This, uh, you know, it gave Russia a chance to bolt, bolt out of the system. If they had kept them trading inside the system and then, you know, reduce trade step by step, it was too fast and too quick, uh, and um, Russia went into survival mode, um, and it jerked and it went into you know uh, trading, trading into local currencies, trading at low, low low prices. All the countries which needed the oil took it. So uh, there, there are never no takers for oil in the uh, international system. We know that Jay, they will take it. So this was the only flaw I felt in Biden's policy that he implemented the sanctions too fast, too quick. He should have gone step by step. Well, you know, and uh, as a result of all of that, maybe too quick and also not in the right way and not and not completely. If you're going to do it, you got to be smart. Um, you know, Putin has resisted and deflected the sanctions and gotten around them. I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. He's taken so many steps to avoid them. And in my view, this whole BRICS meeting is a, another way to avoid the sanctions. And then you get Trump in this country saying, you know, he's going to lay tariffs on everybody and charge astronomical tariff rates and without thinking about what countries or what effect. And so I think we are at a time, Rupmani, where the, the lack of efficacy of sanctions has been revealed. The lack of efficacy of tariffs has been revealed. And this thing about punishing other countries, um, you know, through sanctions and tariffs has been revealed. It doesn't work. I think we are learning that. Do you agree? Absolutely right, Jay. You, you, you speak the right thing at the right time. <laughs> but, uh, Jay, these uh, two things work in the international system. It's military, military uh, alliance or uh, economic alliance. Now, the military alliance like NATO works because you want... Europe wants that security umbrella provided by the U.S. So they come into this. Um, economic alliance works because everybody needs the money. People resist to go to war if you don't want to go into recession. Now, CJ, in the face of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, 
There were such essential commodities like we discussed oil. The second was that Ukraine and Russia are the bread baskets of the world. So we had a green channel being set up by the UN. There was movement of the wheat at least going on. Agriculture did not have to get affected by it. So economics plays a very big part. And Putin is very shrewd. He is a master politician in which he is just emphasizing economics in this summit. He is not talking of anything else. And uh, very uh, smoothly he is saying, let's have a zone where we do inter-trading. Uh, in the currencies of uh, the BRICS members. Let's form a zone where you're not dependent on the uh, exchange rates or on the dollar. So he's, he knows what he's doing. Jay. Economics and military. Two, two parts, two parts of the spectrum. Jay. Well, you know what troubles me is that uh, I mean, this is really propaganda and it dovetails with uh, was it Trump who recently said, oh, yeah, it was Trump who recently said that it was um, Zelensky's fault that Putin attacked Ukraine. It was Zelensky. That was that was something that Zelensky created, not Putin. And I, and I feel that um, that's what Putin is selling. And, uh, you know, in the in the context of this meeting, I'm sure he's selling the very same thing in the context of these meeting. This meeting, he's he's telling all these guys that, yeah, it was Zelensky did this to me. He's the bad guy. And so he's he's focusing this kind of crazy propaganda like Trump is. They they do talk to each other, you know, and it isn't about their favorite recipes. Um <laughs> recipes for disaster is what it is. Um, so I, I'm thinking that this meeting is a great opportunity for him to do propaganda and have people repeat his propaganda. Yeah, and you thought about the zone, your comment about the zone. Yeah, I've seen that too. And the, and the Putin zone uh, could really have legs. And the question I put to you is, is this meeting going to have legs? You say it only meets once a year, but you know there could be some material results here that would benefit Vladimir Putin and Russia that come out of this meeting that would cement relations or whether they be economic or trade relations or what have you, just human relations between these countries. And I am worried that he will achieve things that we may not even realize uh, between the meetings, not just once a year. What do you think? Right, Chick. Right on point, because uh, he was so starved for the international diplomacy that the moment this uh, Russia has to take up the presidency of this, he is taking it and he is having 17 bilaterals. We are not counting the private uh, um, encounters that he's having with the leaders, but 17 head-on bilaterals which is put in. The teams are meeting otherwise. There are going to be extra uh, agendas or meetings set up for the future. Already one December 12th uh, is being planned for India-Russia cooperation on uh, some, uh, you know, more economics. So uh, China and Russia are going to have, I think, three bilateral, something like that, Jay. So this is going to be very, uh, he's coming, he's showing the world that he is not isolated. He has his friends. Uh, and he, it's in the face of Zelensky because Zelensky was standing on a podium yesterday asking countries to try to isolate him, to try to keep him away. And Jay, he is carrying the world's 24% uh, of global economics with him. So Putin is really gloating in this summit. And that is what is coming across, Jay, when you see him indulging in this kind of diplomacy and uh, uh, giving... Uh, uh, demeaning the ICC uh, arrest warrant against him and showing to him showing to the world that he is um, he is an independent leader and he does not uh, follow you know he does not accept his ruling as an international criminal yeah that seems clear this this meeting is in aid of that very effort it's time for me to make you the secretary of state again OK, and uh, let's assume for this discussion that you're the secretary of state under uh, under Harris, not under um, Trump, because you, you wouldn't serve under Trump. I know you would. not. <laughs> I wouldn't want you to. Uh, but um, under Harris, you might have a chance to do the right thing. And so my question is, what is the right thing? Because, you know, this is this is very threatening in the 
in the intermediate term and the long term to the United States and, and its interests. So what does the United States do to, to countermand, to countervail what Putin is trying to achieve and may in, in part or maybe in large part achieve over time uh, with this BRICS organization? How do we um, countermand that? Jay, to counter my, uh, the BRICS efforts of a uh, uh, de-dollarization, the only thing is that to increase, keep on uh, going on the path of progress in our own trade, uh, keep the dollar high, uh, make the alliance. What is happening, Jay? The allies with the U.S. Are the their economies are falling weak. Like we have Canada, which is really having a tough time with the economy. You know, you have the rent side, the recession has hit. There's no money in the market. Uh, it's unemployment. It's in shambles. So which countries used to be uh, highly developed are falling apart. So the U.S. has to carry the burden of itself along with these people. And uh, on the other hand, BRICS has emerging economies. So they're not enemies. Uh, only maybe uh, Russia we don't have to associate with. But uh, the rest are not enemies, so to uh, interact with them and keep the interaction very strong is uh, should be the priority. And G20 is coming up uh, in a couple of months. In that, October, is uh, uh, we have to uh, really put ourselves in the front there because remember the last uh, G20 that happened in India, they spoke about the uh, highway which was going to be made, the, um, the economic route which was going to be made. So Saudi Arabia, the US, India, Italy, all came together. So we have to look at the larger picture and ignore this part for some time. Maybe five, six countries will form the financial architecture, but to what extent it will work also is the uh, this how we're getting local currencies to deal with local currencies is also a big problem. Jay. It's not very easy. They try to do that with uh, the ruble and uh, um, the yen. So it's not very easy. They need uh, a lot of uh, implementation skills, Jay. And the dollar is very well established. Uh, only 40 are there, 160 are this side. So uh, it's not a lost cause yet. It just ha it just needs patience to deal with Putin, Jay. Would you be concerned that Europe uh, will be undermined in some way by BRICS? It's Europe is Western Europe is not there. It's not participating. But what can it do to countermand any effect on its countries, on NATO, for example? Jay, we saw the G7 happening in Italy uh, last time. So they needed the guests to come in and you know balance it out. They're not the top seven producing countries, uh, top economies in the world. That is where you need reform of the international uh, organization. You need the top seven to associate in the G7. You need the G top 20 to associate in the G20. It can't be something which has been formed in the beginning. Uh, the G7 has to keep, so rotating, when you have rotating, um, if you are the top seven economy, you will meet at the G7. That will create a competition in between them. It can't be a set format that just these economies will come. Italy, Canada did not have an economy as large as China or India. So if you have that competing spirit, then it goes. The US is uh, fabulous as a hegemon. But uh, to carry the burden of these countries is uh, what is pulling down the dynamism of uh, the US on the world stage. NATO creates a military umbrella for entire Europe. Uh, G7, the financial uh, architecture is of the US. So uh, to bring it back somewhat close to globalization, it needs to have, uh, it needs to give a little loose uh, leash to the sanctions regime. A little mm. bit it has to be mm. loosened up. You know, the other thing that strikes me from our discussion here today is that the G20 um, ought to be a real, um, a real extravaganza. The United States has the influence to do that. Uh, it ought to be the best G20 that has ever happened. You know, Putin made uh, this BRICS meeting a kind of trade show, and he was showing off all these products and making it very glitzy. I've seen photographs of what he has done. Well, um, we ought to, you know, follow the same playbook and and show the success of the U.S. economy, and show the consolidation of the European economy. Uh, we ought to make the G20 a 
a really terrific extravaganza just to demonstrate how strong we are compared to them and how real we are compared to them. Do you agree? Yeah, Jay. It's uh, see, Br uh, BRICS right now is an inflated show. It's it's not real. It's not happening. But what is happening in the G20 under the US is real. It's actual reality that is happening. This is a make believe utopian viewpoint of what should happen. A network of commercial banks talk about how much you can uh, coordinate. There's a lot of coordination required. Uh, something like that was close to the IMF infrastructure. Now the IMF gave loans and you know it had debt sanctions and debt traps and all that so financial structure to create and to implement is a very huge task and russia right now is uh, in the infrastructure financial infrastructure that is infancy state stage it's not uh fully blown so uh the u.s has to like you said cash in on what it has in hand it has to showcase its um what do you say prowess on the international stage and it has to really um, have a very firm stand and they, there should be no uh, what do you say lethargicness in the foreign policy Jay. because during biden's time until the last two years we have seen a lethargic uh, reaction to international politics there was no show up upfrontmanship or there was no um, you know you, there was no hardcore decisions that were taken it was only when the israel uh, conflict happened that biden came into his uh, true colors and he came to the forefront otherwise you had him a little bit in the background that cannot happen with the us it always has to take center stage there is no uh, compromise on that well you know i'm i'm thinking of um, some midwestern state um where people don't know anything about what we've been discussing not a thing. Uh, they don't know what BRICS is. They don't know what it means. They don't know how it affects uh, the rest of the world, Europe, Africa, Latin America, and certainly the US and Asia. So my question to you is, what would you say to somebody who is completely ignorant and uncaring about US foreign policy and about the US reaction to BRICS? What would you say to them about uh, how this might affect them? how they should care about it yeah jay this will uh if if successful it would affect the domestic uh, uh the u.s population because uh if successful we get uh the dollar being limited in the international system when that happens we have recession we have inflation your food prices rise your rent rises you know you have more um uh, immigrants coming in so so all these things uh work out it's a cycle that happens step by step. So that's how foreign policy affects your in domestic um, spheres. So that's what that's what uh, would happen if the BRICS was successful in what it's planning to do. We all have to be concerned. George Will, uh, I think the Washington Post recently wrote a column saying that neither of the campaigns going on now is putting enough emphasis on foreign policy. They really should have. And they should, you know, make sure to cover foreign policy going forward, whoever gets elected. And of course, uh, it would be better if uh, Kamala Harris got elected because she would, um, you know, do intelligent foreign policy, especially if you were her secretary of state. Huh? <laughs> anyway, Rupmati, thank you so much. We've had a great discussion about this. Uh, I feel I've learned a lot about it and I uh, needed to. Um, and I hope we can follow up and see how it works after the fact. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks for watching. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Aloha, Jay.